Thanks for visiting us today in this uh, video cast. Um, I'm continuing the series on not just about the drums. Obviously, drums aren't the only instrument in the world, although some drummers may want to think that. But we play with other members of the band, guitar, piano, bass, and that kind of thing. But it's not just about the players. It's also about the guys who support the players, the guitar techs, the guys that set up um, lighting, all that kind of stuff. And today we have Mitch Weissman with us. He's um, an acquaintance of Chris Alvarado in a previous video that we um, that we did. And he's going to talk to us about some of the things he does to um, set up guitars and you know his background in that. And I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So Mitch Weissman, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. It's nice to meet you. Thanks, Mitch. So um, tell me, Mitch, how did you get into um, well, the guitar business per se in your side of it? I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Yeah. I started out, I had worked 29 years for Motorola. Okay. I'm an electrical engineer by, if you want to call it trade, profession, by profession. I worked on the first cell phone. I worked on the first group of radios that went into 900 megahertz. I also worked with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carino Balzano, and we did the first RF emissions in human tissue where we took medical samples and drilled holes and measured how much RF is absorbed. So I've always been gifted to be, if you will, at the right place at the right time. So we start out by me leaving New York with a degree in automotive, coming to Florida, and wanting to go to school for mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering in Florida at that time was building trusses for houses. So I switched to electronics. At about the same time that I did that, I had made friends with a, another young man, John Ferriola, from New York, who joined a band called Pearl. In the late 70s, early 80s, Pearl was the band in Fort Lauderdale. They wrote their own materials, they played their own songs, they, they performed in front of thousands back in the days when most people were struggling going from bars to bars to bars. One of the things I noticed is that everything would break. The amps would break, the cars would break, the trucks would break, right. the, the guitars. So, the Rogers, right? Oh, you know, <laughs> duct tape is your best friend. So my friend John took his instrument to somebody very nice guy by the name of Dave Asif, who became very friendly with me over the years. In fact, many years after I met him, almost uh, 30, one of my daughters dated this son because they went to the same high school. So like you say, it's a small world. But I started looking at the guitar and trying to understand how it functioned. And maybe because I come from a, a place where I always think out of the box. I viewed the guitar as a drummer would view a snare head. It's all about tension. Because after all, a drummer hits the head to create the sound. A guitar player hits the string to create the vibration. So now with a piano where you have it all stretched out over a frame, and all you do is you take a hammer and you hit it, and then you take away something to allow it to sustain more. A guitar is more like the drums because it's more organic. You're actually hitting it with your fingers and your hands. So by doing that, if you understand where a drummer comes from and the dynamics of drumming, where you hit it in the head, how you hit it on the head, whether you hit it hard, whether you hit it soft, the dynamics of it carry over into the guitar. <clears throat> so now, if you know that you got a properly tuned snare, you can hit that on the edge and it'll just slice you. Yeah. And then you can go in the middle and you'll get that warm where it's actually in your diaphragm. Right. Well, I realize the guitar is the same way. A guitar is basically made up of three angles. You have the angle where the strings go to the machine heads to put the tension on. You have the angle where it comes over the bridge 
which is the other anchor point, yeah. and then you have the angle of the neck joining the body. Now, by learning to adjust these angles, I've been very successful in understanding how a guitar works. Because we get back to, it's still your finger hitting that string to create the right vibration. So with that bit of knowledge, I went and tried to study different people and what they did. And I found, if you will, a kinship in Leo Fender. Because while he was understood mechanical principles like me, he was not a musician like me. So he associated with great musicians and they would feed the information back. I think Leo's best asset was his ability to listen. And I try to pride myself in my ability to listen. So while some guy might be going, gee, it's going puke, 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 the next guy's going, it's going plunk, plunk, plunk. And one guy goes, it farts out. The other guy goes, it frets out. They're all talking about the same thing in just describing it in their language. So learning how to listen is very important. So do you, um, how much have you played? I mean, is it more like when you play, you feel a certain or hear a certain thing? Or do you base more of what, what you do hearing others playing? As a player, I suck. <laughs> you know, I'm bad. I could blow a gig in about half a song. People would get up, walk out. I can do it in about the first measure if I sing along with it. Ah, clear the room. So, by having associated with people that really excelled, um, I've been very gifted. And I sat with people and I talked with people. My friend John was very instrumental in telling me how the guitar made him feel. And that by me adjusting it, I can create a pleasurable feel or an unpleasurable feel. <clears throat> I have a friend by the name of Mike Corbin. Phenomenal player. Just phenomenal. Very technical. As good as anybody out there. Speed, agility, tone, has it all. <clears throat> Great player. Describes to me the concept of trying to let it come from his mind through the guitar. And what hinders him in, in the things that he did. Right. So, you know, these were fundamental guys that started. But probably one of the most important people in my life and career was a good friend of mine by the name of Wally Voss. Wally Voss was a phenomenal bass player. Played with Yngwie. Uh, you mean Yngwie Malmsteen? Yngwie yeah. Malmsteen. Yeah. He just was very instrumental. I met him, I was 18, he was, uh, he was uh, 17 at the time. And as this band formed, when you live and breathe the music, we worked together. He taught me how to paint cars. I, I did all the body work. I painted cars. Um, as he went up in his career, he would always come back. We'd always come back. There was a core group of us. A drummer, a guitar player, a singer. We just lived and breathed the music and that carried over into probably all facets of my life. Um, one of my friends, in fact he was the best man at my wedding, was a guy named Ray Dorso. Tremendous sound man. Install, create, mix sound. Some of the best bands ever. I, I, I can't, there'd be a whole laundry list of bands I've seen him do movies for soundtrack. I've seen uh, albums he's uh, engineered and produced. Just phenomenal, the ear, and how it really is an organic thing. You can go off and you can 
study and you can have measurement and you can have theory but it's the organic thing that really makes it that's why when you see a drummer who's phenomenal they feel it they breathe it every breath every beat of their heart kind of carries over in the drums and that's it's interesting you mentioned that i didn't i never thought of it before until you mentioned it just now how similar drums are to guitars and even though the piano is a percussive instrument and more associated with dr with drumming that way but it's like you open my eyes to how the guitar actually is very closely related to the drums music is the first form of communications before a baby can understand words formulate words or speak words they sing they sing, they, they cry, they sing, they moan. It's very fundamental. It's tonal. Yeah. Very organic. And that's where it all comes from. The organic measurement that's built inside every person. Now you can hear somebody say, oh, I'm tone deaf. And I, had a, I actually had a college professor who thought he was a great musician. And he said, oh, I can play a guitar. And he goes, I've done it mathematically. You take a guitar, it's 24 frets, two octaves. You break it down. The whole system of guitar is in fourths. And you can, if you know the math, and I said, well, play something for me. And he did. And it was soulless. There was no feeling in it. It was mathematically correct. But almost flawless. You need the mistakes. Drummers are great because when they make a mistake, they fill it into the song. Right? The best drummers can play a song from the beginning to the end, from the end back to the beginning, and from the inside out. When you're doing four measures and it's the same pattern over and over, it's the drummer who drives the band down the center. He can play from the inside out. Great guitarists have that ability. They can play it from the forward to the from the front to the end, from the end to the uh, front, and then from the inside out. You listen to like Steve Morse, who I've actually had the pleasure of meeting many times. Again, the University of Miami jazz band. When the Dixie Drakes first came up. We were out there in the music. I remember seeing the band in a small auditorium, yep. you know, not being more than 10 feet away from them. You know, these are the people who understand the concept that drummers live by, that you can play a song from the inside out. That's really, that's a great insight. Um, what, are, so what are some of the people, uh, maybe in the music business, that you know, some names that people might recognize that maybe you've worked with or that have even guitars that you've worked on? Well, probably the most famous guy has to be Bo Diddley. I met Bo Diddley, oh, got to be 22 years ago. Actually, it was 24 years ago. Uh, I went to a birthday party. I met a gentleman who was a good friend of his who approached me and said, gee, can you build a guitar? I said, yes, I can build a guitar. I, he goes, can you build a square guitar like Bo Diddley's? I go, it's rectangular. So he knew I was the guy. So I built the first Bo Diddley guitar for Bo's, one of Bo's best friends, a gentleman by the name of Charlie Toner. And when I did it, I really didn't know how close he was with Bo. We then went to Bo's house in Archer, Florida, which is right by the college town of Gainesville. And I met Bo Diddley for the first time, where he stuck a hammer in my hand and told me to go build some steps for his trailer. <laughs> and um, it was a long and prosperous relationship. He, he had these ideas about a guitar with built-in effects. And he needed it rectangular. So I had built a Fender scale length, 25 and a quarter, rectangular guitar with a built-in 10-band EQ, a built-in digital delay, a built-in phase shifter, and 
the ability to input other objects, whether it be a drum machine or uh, some kind of uh, effects processor, you could plug it into the guitar and have it blend with the guitar and have it come out a single output. Now I used to kid Bo, I go, now you can do weddings and bar misfits, you can be a one man band. That turned out to be Bo Diddley's best guitar. He, out of all his guitars, he owned it for like uh, 14 years. Yeah. And uh, I remember the day he came to me and he said, uh, we were sitting over Charlie's house and he goes, Mitch, you're going to be mad. I go, what Bo? He goes, I sold your guitar. I go, Bo, I built that guitar for one thing so you can go out and earn a living. That was meant for you to go earn money. And I said, all I want to know is, did you get really good money? And he go, oh, Mitch, I got great money. I said, God bless you. He wound up selling it to the actor Steven Seagal. And it, for a while it dwelled in Steven's possession. And then Charlie, through charm, wit, and grace, Actually, he got it back. How he did it, I'll never understand. But that guitar that I built for Bo Diddley now resides with Charlie, who owns number one and number two. Now, the number three rectangular guitar I built was for a gentleman by the name of Scott Potaski. Now, that might not ring a bell, but if I gave you his stage name of Daisy Berkowitz, Everybody would realize he was the founding member of Marilyn Manson. He was just a young kid, 16 years old, coming over here. He was brought over by Jordy White, who was the bass player for Marilyn Manson. Also played bass for Perfect Circle and Nine Inch Nails. One of the few people I ever met who had perfect pitch. My favorite Geordie story is they were sitting right where we are now. My son was only about two years old and he had like the big dreads, mm -hmm. but he had a multicolored. My little son sitting on the floor with him playing Star Wars and looks up at his hair and stands up, grabs a big handful of his hair and goes, Geordie, how come you got in your hair? <laughs> Two years old, I didn't know he knew the word. Yeah. Jordy's just 40, he goes, hey! <laughs> but Scott, this was after he left Marilyn Manson, he was known by his Ouija board guitar. And he had taken the guitar because he had an endorsement through Jackson and painted Ouija board symbols on it. And that was what he was known for. He eventually sold that guitar to the hard rock. Now, what happened was he was coming over and he was watching the Bo Diddley guitar evolve. And he asked me, can you do something like a Ouija board? I said, well, bring me over what you got. So he brings me over a Ouija board and I look at it and I don't think much of it. It's just a just Ouija a board, you know. And I, I go in the closet and I have a piece of mahogany and I slap this thing on and I create the Ouija board guitar. Now when Scott comes over and he goes, where's my Ouija board? I go, wait, you'll see. And I unveil the guitar and his jaw drops. He goes, and he was just floored because here was the actual Ouija board on the guitar with uh, two humpuckers set up with, and it's a guitar so it has binding. That's when he tells me, that's an antique Ouija board. It's from the early 30s, late 20s. I bought it, I spent a lot of money for it in, a, in New Orleans. I went, well now it's a guitar! <laughs> Can you do it? Yeah. Now, um, the next rectangular instrument I made was a bass. Um, Charlie has a bass player friend, uh, Mike, and Mike was going to play a bunch of gigs with Bo Diddley. So Bo was going to have his rectangular guitar, Charlie was going to have number one, the first one I made, so Mike needed a bass. And so I built him a bass. And it's made out of some very rare uh, exotic wood called Paduke. And it's a rectangular bass, it's super light, 
and there's all these videos floating around of Bo with his rectangular with Charlie and Mike. There they were, the, you know, up front. Now, uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of pride in seeing your work, you know, being, you know, well, displayed that way, I would think. It, it's like the pit crew in the NASCAR team. Or, you know, everybody pulls their part. Everybody's part of a team. That was one of the things of being uh, an electrical engineer for 29 years, realizing that you're just part of a team. Yeah. Now, pride, my pride is when I watch somebody perform a feat on the instrument and have it stay in tune. And, ha and they look out at me and they smile because they didn't think it was going to make it. And the guitar players know what I mean. The wrong move, the wrong place, and the guitar is done. You got to put it on the side and you switch. So the last guitar was for uh, Rectangular One, was for a gentleman by the name of Martin Davis. He was going on the road with Scott uh, Petaskey and the Ouija board guitar and needed the matching bass. You can see both instruments if you go to YouTube and there's a band called Kill Miss Pretty and they have a video with both instruments in it and you know like you say it's, uh, that's a proud moment for me because that's like watching your kids get graduated in high school and stuff. That's great. Um, let's talk about this little area. You got okay, um, one okay. last thing. Yeah. Um, to finish up on the Bo Dooley guitar, Bo had been given a guitar by Gretsch which sold an auction after his death for $60,000. They estimate the value of the guitar I made him at a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Because it's a one of a kind, he got his Grammy with it, he got his lifetime achievement. You know, if you ever see Bo's appearance on the television show, According to Jim, that's my guitar, he's fine. I'm going to have to go. Have to go. <laughs> this is the area my wife allows me to work in. She, uh, she hated the Bo Diddley guitar. There was sawdust every place. It was in the air conditioning ducts. It was in my hair. The dog we had at the time would cough and sawdust would come out. She did not like that at all. But um, this is where I do a lot of my... Uh, creative thinking. When you work and you're in a place and you get that vibe, it's like I got the AC blowing right on me, I got a refrigerator behind me, I can catch the TV out of the corner of my eye, I got the phone, I got the soldering station, everything is here. I've done amazing work here. I created the Bo Diddley guitar, uh, I have a friend Shane Kelly, I made two miniature Flying V headless guitars. But uh, one of the guys that I did a lot of work for was a gentleman by the name of Dan Spitz, the original guitar player for Anthrax. Dan and I met uh, through, he had somebody bring a couple of guitars to me. I set them up, and when we talked about it, he had to meet me. When uh, it was weird because he'd been out of music for over 10 years and he became a Swiss certified watchmaker. Now, what he can make fixing watches, because he has, there's only six degrees that you can get and he's got them all. He's authorized to make the gears that go in the Rolex and he chooses me to work on his guitars. He brought me a guitar that Paul Reed Smith had given him. It was a $10,000 custom shop, and he had me modify it. When he took it back to Paul Reed Smith and said, this is the guitar that you guys have to make me, they looked at it and went, you did what to our guitar? And he goes, I didn't do it. My friend Mitchell did it, you know? And um, it's the one with the flames. And when Anthrax called him to do the 25th anniversary, he was ready. And then everything was just synchronicity. It all came into to, together. 
me getting the guitars, him falling in love with the guitar again and playing it. Now, his brother also came to me. His brother is Dave the Beast Spitz. He's a bass player, phenomenal bass player. Uh, bands like White Snake, White Lion, uh, Black Sabbath, Dave's played in them all. So from one brother to the next. And these guys have really pushed me to the edge. I have a, another gentleman by the name of Mickey Free. Yeah. Mickey Free was the original guitar player in Shalomar with Jody Watley. He was discovered by Gene Simmons. Now, Mickey is probably one of the most, if you will, organic. He squeezes notes out of the guitar that, that just resonate deep inside. Phenomenal player. Again, asked me to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Tremolos. Tremolos are really tough. When you bring a tremolo down, it's got to work one way, and when it comes back, it's supposed to stay in tune. And as most of you listeners will know, um, Fender stock tremolos really don't work well. But then look at Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck gets it to work. Well, about this, you know, about the time I guess Blow by Blow was coming out, and he was still in the Les Pauls, I was gone back and read Leo Fender. And I wanted to know what he tried to do with this tremolo. What was his thoughts? And there were an article, a bunch of articles in Guitar Player describing the man. Uh, and David Lindley had a lot to say about Leo Fender. Through those articles, I understood what Leo was trying for. And I'm probably, and I really say myself, because I don't know of anybody else who can take a stock Fender tremolo, have it drop down a whole half step, and the chord will stay in tune with itself. When it comes back, it'll come back to pitch, and it'll still be in tune, and you can pull up a half step. So you can go down a half step, you can go up a half step, and it returns in tune. Many people like Mickey Free and many people who do the Jimi Hendrix kind of thing come to me for that. That's what I'm probably most known for, is making that stupid piece of pop metal work correctly. Yeah. So there's a lot of nuance involved there, and even companies that are established, so they don't always get it right themselves. Well, that's, that's very true. Um, I see stuff that people put out. Uh, it's kind of strange because the formula, there is a formula to putting together a guitar. And I see a lot of people, for the sake of being different, going away from that formula. So there are people out there that uh, uh, are doing stuff that, while it might be very pretty, has no form or function, or if I like to say organic. Now one of the nicest things I've seen is this guy Jeff Babbitts. He makes a full contact guitar, an acoustic guitar is phenomenal. His stuff that he's manufacturing now, bridges and components for, for Fender style and Gibson style guitar, he's got it. He understands. Another guy who understands is Tommy from USA Custom. He understands the formula. And while there's people coming out and new, new people coming along, some of the greats have left us. The D'Angelicos, the D'Aguestos, the people who, who, through trial and error, made a lot of crap before they made a lot of great stuff. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of where I come from, where I started with imported guitars. I was working third shift at Motorola, and I scour every pawn shop. 
I scour every used furniture store, every yard sale. I would pick up 64, 65 Fender Mustangs for 25 or 30 bucks. I'd pick up Ibanez Les Paul copies and Strat copies for 15, 20 dollars. I'd pick up, you know, Firebirds, not the the original ones, but what they call uh, the non-reverse ones, 35, 40 dollars. SGs, Les Pauls, Strats. I've had probably tens of thousands of guitars through my hands. There was my friend Wally, his cousin had a place in Fort Lauderdale called Musicians Exchange. And I used to go there and sell to his cousin Sheldon Voss. One day Sheldon went to me, he goes, look, why don't we do a consignment deal? I'll give, I'll keep 20% but I'll sell everything you got. I said, how many people you do consignments with? He goes, nobody right now, you'd be the first. I go, okay, then we'll go 10. And we shook on it. It was 1979 or 1980, I walked into the store and 80% of the instruments in there were mine. So while I helped establish Musicians Exchange and their bread and butter, there was another side to them where they had name acts coming, jazz, uh, acoustic, blues, anybody who was everybody in their off time, when they weren't playing big arenas or before they got very big, I can remember seeing Derek Trucks. 12 years old with his baseball hat backwards playing the slide on an SG because his uncle had brought him there to play with a, a blues band. I can remember sitting in front of uh, Warren Hayes, No Father Than I Am For You, watching Government Mule when they first came out. You know, it's just, I've been very fortunate that I'm in the heart of not only Southern Rock, but now Latin rock. One of my uh, all longtime friends and someone I had done a lot of work for was a gentleman by Wesley B. Wright. He was the founding member of the Sound Machine. You know, the stuff he taught me about syncopated rhythms on guitar is priceless. And you know, and we would sit down and maybe have some chicken wings or a sandwich and a coke and just talk music. That's, that's really good. So let's say you have maybe someone who, or many people actually, really can't afford, you know, the stock, not the stock guitar, but let's say a specialty guitar, for example, you know, Gibson and Alex Lace and a Rush collaborated to make his new uh, uh, Gibson guitar. Right. Um, but not everybody can afford something like that. Um, you know, what would it take for someone to maybe start getting to know their guitar more? On a per, you know, on a well, technical level, to maybe get into something like this that you that you do. One one of the big misconceptions is that you have to spend a lot of money to get a well playing guitar. The truth of the matter is, no, the only difference between an inexpensive guitar and an expensive guitar is its lifespan. An expensive guitar will have high quality wood. It'll have high quality components. An inexpensive guitar will have lesser quality woods, lesser quality components, but they don't play any worse than the expensive ones. Can you give an example of like what would be lesser sure. quality versus higher quality? Okay. This is <clears throat> a Chinese built 20th anniversary Squire Telecaster. When I got it, some, some kid had originally purchased it for like a hundred bucks at one of the big outlet stores, kind of beat it up real bad. The pickups, the components didn't work. <clears throat> so what I did was I took this instrument and I created using it as a canvas 
where most people know that Tellys have single coils, I routed it for these Gibson style humbuckers, or what Gibson's mostly known for. Then, because the bridge was all uh, rusted out from a, a young child just playing it, you know, leaving it around, I replaced it. And I replaced it with a little better one. I replaced it with the tremolo system that you would get from a Stratocaster. So now I have a Tele with two humbuckers and a tremolo, which stays in tune and plays in tune. Now we look at the electronics. So we have two pickups, but I have what's called a super switch, and I have five different sounds in this guitar. I have the bridge and the neck pickups by themselves, and then the three middle positions, I blend them two together in series, in parallel, and in out of phase. So now I've taken an inexpensive guitar and for very little money upgraded it to if you wanted to buy a guitar like this from Fender, you know, you would spend a whole lot of money, fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars. And it plays just as good. So my specialty is taking and creating. I like to think of myself as a hot rodder. The tradition of a hot rodder in our country is guys came back from the war with no money and they took these old cars and the first thing they did is they stripped off all the crap right. and then they modified everything on there to make it go faster. And I think of myself more as a hot rodder than as a you know, luthier, even though that is what my title is. Yeah. So, again, in the same point, I have, I like Telecasters because they're a good template. A canvas, if you will. Yeah. This here came to me as the neck had the frets worn out. The gentleman who owned it wanted to refret it. And I asked him, I said, how in love with you are, are you with this neck? And he said, not very. So we replaced the neck. And he was happier, much happier with the neck he replaced it with. And as part of the payment, he left the old neck here. Then the body came along. So it was an imported guitar and it came along and I took it and I modified it. Now what we have here is we have trisonic pickups. Now these pickups are hand wound by the guy who makes the pickups for Brian May. Uh, through a friend of mine, Roscoe Peterson, he was able to obtain these things and they're in the United States I would say they're very rare. In the configuration that you're looking at here, it's extremely rare because I've modified the standard Tele bridge to hold the pickup, where most people leave this void and use just the saddle pieces. Now, again, with some fancy wiring, this will do everything that a Brian May guitar, his Red Special. By the time they import the Red Specials into the United States, they're 2800 bucks. I can take about $150 worth of parts and create a guitar that's equal to Brian May to most people who enjoy it more because it fits on a canvas that they used to holding, the Telecaster. So this is really more or less what I'm about, is taking and hot riding. You know, uh, I mean, there's always that classic story of the kid's dad going out and buying him a Porsche. And he's going to high school and he's driving a Porsche. 
And then there's the kid who's down the road fixing up an old Nova and sticking a big V8 in it and working on it. And then they go out to race and the Porsche is left in the dust. And that's what I'm trying to do with guitars. I'm trying to say that you don't have to spend a lot to get what you want and it needs to be customized to fit the individual. So really, I mean, brand name is good and all that, but that's really not the bottom line. It's the feel. No. Now, you went through your brother's collection, and, and I know you videotaped it. There's instruments there that so-called guitar snobs would not go near. They would just turn their nose up and walk the other way. But being uh, percolated by me to play and perform, they actually perform better than the instruments that are the equivalent for thousands more. I believe I've studied this in two realms. One is electronics, where part of my job at Motorola was to bring Malaysia to speed with the United States in manufacturing, and that I actually did. And when we started with the Malaysians, it took them 20 years, well, it took the Japanese 20 years to catch up to the United States. It took the Malaysians 10 years. It took the Chinese five. So as we learn to teach others, the, the process gets shorter. Also, it has to do with the fact that they don't have any preconceived ideas. Many uh, Chinese engineers I speak to, I have a lot of fun. I go, when you were growing up in your parents' house, was the bathroom inside or outside? And they go, oh, outside. Almost all of them were raised by farmers for the Communist Party who went to the bathroom outside. They've never seen a black and white TV. They don't know what an A-track player is. They barely, uh, and when I say barely, like maybe 2% know what a cassette player is. They came along when technology was already advanced. They never saw a Mac 2. They don't know what a punch card is. So by starting with a clean slate, they come into it already advanced. And that's the way I see young people coming into music now. You know, their music is such a broad range that there's no preconceived ideas. Nobody can tell these kids they can't mix rap and rock. They can't mix metal and reggae. They can't do these things because they think they can do everything. Yeah. So if you look at the, the prevalent music styles now, you can trace them back to their roots, but then again, it comes down to the younger generation not knowing their limitations or not being not having limitations put on them. Yeah. So that concept of the ones coming into, um, let's say, greener, as it were, that can be um, applied to the guitars as well. Right. It's not a matter of the brand. It's let's just make this work and sound the way I like it and make it feel right. the way I want. If, if you take the snob appeal out, then you get to the organic nature of making music. You know, and, I, and they come and so many people are apologetic, well, this is a no-name guitar. And I've made my career on no-name guitars. You know, lots of people can go out and buy uh, a $40,000 acoustic guitar or a vintage Gibson you know, and they're all bought up, most of these old, vintage, very rare. But when you look through history at what people played and made music on, 
you know, the guys who really made music, they could play a broom handle and still make music, you know, and it's just phenomenal how they did it. You know, I, I had a conversation, I went to a show, and I looked down at this guy and he had a brand new Fender Stratocaster. And I went to this black man and I said, wow, you got a brand new Strat there. And he goes, yes I do, son. And he goes, it used to be that you'd have to play 60 to 100 of them <clears throat> until you found the one that was just right for you. And then he goes, now I just walk in and go, I like that one. Pick it up and it plays. And I laughed and I said, it only took him 60 years for Fender to figure that out. And he laughed and he goes, you sure are right, son. And then this guy came up and go, Mr. Guy, it's time for you to go on. I was having this conversation with Buddy Guy and I never knew it. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so if anybody wants to maybe get in contact with you, if they have any questions after, you know, after seeing this video, seeing... You know, I'm on Facebook. Find me on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and look up Mitchell Weissman with one L, because there's no Helen Mitchell, uh, you'll see all the photographs of uh, guitars that I've done, uh, a few motorcycles, because I, you know, if it smells like gas, it must be a blast. Right. You know, and I just, uh, but um, I'm just a hot rider. And if you look at the people who really did stuff, you know, we follow in the same footprints. The Danny Gattons love their cars, love their guitars, the Chuck Berries, the, the Bo Diddleys, the Jeff Beck has a, a tremendous collection of vintage uh, cars, you know, from the 40s. Um, it's just, they go, it's, it's American. It goes hand in hand. You know, and it's it's now become a universal language. That's great. Um, well, Mitchell, um, I'm gonna when when the video is posted, I'll have your link to your Facebook page there. So sure. People, if they have questions for Mitchell, they can definitely um, you know get in touch with him and and um, ask ask away. One of the things I I believe in, because people did it for me, was paying it forward. I told you about Dave Asif. You know, I asked him for a job once. He looked at my work and he said, "You know, if I if I hire you, you'll work for me for six months and then you'll put me out of business." And I laughed. I go, "Dave, you and I are friends. I'd never do that. I did it inadvertently right. because I understood how the instrument worked." And Dave took a page out of my book. And he went corporate. He became the head refinisher uh, for a major manufacturer of, of uh, furniture. And, you know, because it, the piece of the pop puzzle here in Florida, guitars is just only so much money to be made. Right. And I was, uh, I kind of spoiled it for the other guys. Well, you know, it's, uh, that's when you acquire a skill, you use it. I have, uh, right now I have a young guy, he's 19, he goes by Anonymous Guitars, I found him on Facebook, he lives around the corner, um, any question he has, anything he needs, he, he knows who can call, uh, there's a few of my friends that, that now work on their own guitars, and any questions they have, they call, they ask, because what is information if you don't share it? You know, and if you don't pay it forward, you might as well not pay it at all. Well, I think on, on that note, uh, Mitchell, I'm going to give you thanks for sharing this information. I mean, for me, it was an eye-opener. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a drummer guy, and um, I grew up with uh, a brother who, you know, was a guitar nut all his life. <laughs> now, you know, now when I see when he, you know, after meeting you, I see why he's such a nut with guitars. He's pretty much getting any sound he wants. <laughs> any sound he wants. Yeah. And he's got a collection of, what, 30, 30? 28 guitars now. 28 guitars. 28. You know, back in the day, before he knew me, he had a collection of maybe five or six guitars that were valued 
at the same value as the 28 guitars he now owns because he understands the principle of it doesn't have to be expensive to play good. And uh, a guitar snob is a guitar snob. It, and it's all about making music and being organic. Great. All right, Mitchell. Okay. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. And um, whatever it is, it is. And I know the camera adds 10 pounds. <laughs> This is the Paradiddler.com, the blog for all things drumming. Thanking Mitchell Weissman for spending some time with us. If you have any questions on anything we've discussed, um, you can email me or more at the